Okay, I think it's time to get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, today is um, literally the fourth pit stop in GINS 2020 COVID-19 marathon. As you know, we were supposed to all meet in, in Toronto these days. Um, and for obvious reasons, we are, we are not. Um, and GIN as an organization, the Guidelines International Network um, has um, decided to um, hold these events, these webinars, um, as a replacement, obviously not a full replacement for the, for the actual conference, but um, um, hopefully of interest to the large community. This is the fourth session, as I already said, the first three sessions have gone extremely well, and we hope that we can um, follow suit on, um, with um, um, this session today. We have a really exciting list of uh, um, speakers today, um, and we hope that this will be very interactive. I will say that again. Um, I, I, I would like to thank my, my fellow committee, scientific committee members. Um, this committee was chaired by myself and Miroslav Kluge, um, but really there, were, um, there was a large group of, of people involved in putting this program together. And um, I obviously also um, would already like to thank, um, thank the, um, um, the people who worked behind the scenes to help us organizing this meeting in particular, um, Allison and, and Sweater, who did a lot of um, a lot of the logistics here, um, that I think have show have um, um, have contributed to that. So far, things um, work very well. Um, today, the um, co-moderators are Rodrigo and and Eddie, and I let them introduce themselves when uh, um, when you know it comes to when when it comes to their their time to make their contribution. Um, just to move forward. Um, I'm Holger Schumann. I work at McMaster University, and, and McMaster University was supposed to be the host for the 2020 event, um, which will now take place in 2022. So um, it's just delayed, not scratched. Um, but we were supposed to host that event, and they're now doing this in replacement. So we are actually doing two of these events for, for Jin, um, given the circumstances. Today, um, we have a, a, a great list of, um, of contributors. So Julian Elliott um, um, from Cochrane, Australia, uh, um, Eli Akel from the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. And then we have um, Ole Wichmann from the um, Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, Germany, and three colleagues from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And um, there's a very specific reason for, for having invited um, these, these contributors here. Um, and um, that is in part reflected in the objectives. Before I go to the, to the objectives, um, we, we um, um, just go through the declarations, but the declarations will also be shown by the, by the speakers and they can add them verbally. Um, um, Julian, these are, as far as I understood, um, uh, um, mostly roles with different organizations, Eli declared none, Ole declared none, and, and um, on the next page here are the declarations by our colleagues from the Public Health Agency of Canada um, that are um, essentially roles with, um, I think, that are consistent with, with their employment at the Public Health Agency of, of Canada and some um, rules, um, obviously, with, uh, with the various guideline panels. But, but um, I, I, I will say a little bit more about the introduction and why we chose these topics. But I can already tell you that um, the goal was really to deal with um, living evidence, the evidence, um, how it is changing, how those who will have to start implementing it or are already implementing it, um, dealing with it, and what the mechanisms are for achieving um, recommendations that, that then actually can be utilized by the various stakeholders. So um, just um, a reminder that we would like to actively encourage you to participate in today's some um, interactive session. You have the chat. Um, this has worked very well in the previous sessions and uh, um, we've, we've really had a lot of back and forth and I know that people have also been chatting privately. We didn't um, turn this function off because we think it's important. I personally thought it was important um, for networking opportunities because you might meet people online here um, and that is a little bit of a replacement perhaps for not meeting in person. The session will last approximately two hours. Um, there will be time for questions throughout and so after each presentation um, um, with one small um, caveat that I will explain a little bit further. Um, so after each of the all of the presentations and then at the end um, we have quite a few questions that that we already prepared and discussed 
um, that um, um, we will post, but ideally these questions come obviously from, from you as the audience. And the recording of this session will be available on the GIN website. Um, we've done this with all of the all of the sessions. Um, so if you've participated already in the previous three or less sessions, um, this is a, a repetition. But um, GIN really focuses on um, trustworthy and accessible guidance for better health. Our mission is to lead, strengthen, and support the collaboration and work within the guide on development, adaptation, and implementation community. Um, I'm a member of the board of trustees for disclosure of GIN, and um, um, obviously have worked with this community for quite some time. Jin, um, and that's why I have kept involved and why I encourage everybody to get involved, provides a network and, and, and partnerships um, or facilitates partnerships. It assists members in reducing duplication of effort and promote best practice through the development of opportunities for learning and building capacity. Um, the objective of today's session, I already started mentioning it, is really to describe how living recommendations and living evidence, living systematic reviews work together um, and how this can be achieved. But going beyond that, going beyond that really is, um, is how we are reacting um, to these, the, the change in data, the change in recommendations and how this will be achieved both in the future. We have some great examples from the vaccination field, but also talking about public health today um, um, with the various speakers. So um, I start with introducing um, speaker number one, and I have to confess that we will have one recording today, and that's the recording from Julian Elliott for simple logistic issues. He's uh, housed in, in Australia and took a break from COVID-19 work, um, um, and this would have been in the middle of his, of his night. He provided an excellent 12 minute uh, um, um, presentation that I will play in a second. Um, we are here to answer questions that um, relate to his presentation as far as we can, obviously. Um, after that, everything will be, almost everything will be live. Uh, there's a little surprise in here, um, but um, um, after that, everything will be live. And in general, we, we have created present, or we've asked the, the speakers to present uh, um, within about 10 to 12 minutes then questions and answers, except for um, our colleagues from, from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, they um, um, as, um, um, will have about 20 minutes for presentation as there are three presenters. Okay, so let me, um, um, let me, do, let me start here with uh, um, that um, first, playing that very first um, presentation. I will stop sharing my screen for just a second. And um, if in the meantime, Rodrigo and Eddie want to say hi, then um, that would be a good, um, good opportunity now. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Eddie Lang. I am an emergency physician based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I've been uh, very fortunate to be part of the scientific committee. I've attended a number of GIN meetings in the past and am, have an avid interest in uh, resuscitation and emergency medicine guidelines. Great to see such a good turnout. Looking forward to a fantastic session. Over to you, Rodrigo. Uh, okay, good morning to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, wherever you are in or around the world. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to co share this season, uh, this session with Harger and Eddie. Um, I am Rodrigo Pardo, I am a neurologist and full professor at the National University in Colombia, and I have been involved in gene activities in the last 10 years. I am an advisor of the National Ministry of Health in Colombia in order to support our national guideline program. And currently I am the head of the Ibero-American Regional Working Group within the GIN. Um, I have no uh, conflict of interest to declare for this session and uh, my activities are all are concerned with GIN activities. Very welcome to everyone. And I am sure we'll have a very nice and exciting session and uh, for sure you are going to enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you, Rodrigo. And I should have said, I also declare no um, um, interests in, in this session. Obviously, I've been part of the organizing committee here, and, uh, but have no financial or indirect financial conflicts of interest. 
I will just uh, um, start with um, Julian's presentation. My name is Julian Elliott. I'm the director of the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in the session. So just in terms of my interests, uh, I'm also an infectious disease physician, a leader evidence systems for Cochrane. I'm based at Cochrane Australia Monash University and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Covidence, a non-profit platform for systematic review production. So I think we're all aware that the status quo, unfortunately, is that key decision makers in our healthcare system are overwhelmed with the amount of information, often conflicting and unfiltered. We, of course, try to address their needs through the development of evidence-based guideline recommendations. And whilst this model has been established now for many years, we believe one of the key challenges in addressing end user needs is combining trustworthiness, quality, with currency, so improving the efficiency of our systems so that we can produce evidence-based guidelines that are not only trustworthy, but also up to date with the latest research. So for many years, we've been working on this trade-off between trust and currency and working to break that and produce guidelines that address the key needs of our stakeholders. So coming into the pandemic, I think we've seen, of course, this flood of uh, controversy, conflict, um, social media storms around uh, new treatments, new interventions. And in that context, we've also seen the rise of conflicting recommendations. Certainly in Australia, where we have quite a fragmented guideline sector, we, in the early part of the uh, pandemic, saw the rise of multiple guidelines, position statements, protocols, often of low quality, coming from various um, jurisdictions uh, and uh, special societies. So in that context, we were concerned about ongoing competing position statements and guidelines are uh, leading to an increasing sense of anxiety uh, and confusion amongst clinicians. And so in the, in the middle of March, uh, we established the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, uh, which initially started with four national clinical organisations and has since grown to 31 organisations. And those organisations have really come together to speak with one voice. So to reduce that cacophony of, of conflicting positions, um, to use an evidence-based approach, and to have the hard conversations within our panels, within the task force, so that we can have very clear and consistent uh, national guidelines. So we use the living evidence approach. We first published on this concept now six years ago, uh, and since then have been developed in initially living systematic reviews, um, through a number of Cochrane and non-Cochrane pilots. Uh, and then in 2018, we established the Australian Living Evidence Consortium to pursue the development of living national guidelines. Initially, partnering with the Stroke Foundation to develop national stroke guidelines, and more recently, national living guidelines in diabetes. So on the foundation of that work, we've now moved to the development of living evidence-based national COVID-19 clinical guidelines. So if you think of this model, uh, in contrast to conventional clinical guidelines where we might update every three to five years, this is really like climbing a mountain, doing all of that work to get to an up-to-date guideline and then leaving it in that state. Over a period of time, the currency of that guideline uh, deteriorates, like walking down the mountain again. And then at some point in the future, we make a decision to update again, like climbing the mountain once more. Whereas in the model we're pursuing, we are using evidence-based approaches, but also updating our guidelines every week. So in this model, for each recommendation, we have to do that initial work of getting the recommendation in a, in a baseline um, publication. Once we have that baseline recommendation, we can then maintain that um, using daily evidence surveillance and feeding through that evidence to our guideline panels each week so that the guideline is maintained in an up-to-date state. So it's like walking across the plateau rather than walking down to the valley and climbing the mountain again. 
The guidelines address the full spectrum of, of clinical care in COVID-19 from primary right through to critical care. Uh, we tend to develop recommendations initially for adults uh, and then they'll be reviewed for specific patient populations. So to give you some idea about how in practice this actually works, uh, our evidence team runs the nightly evidence surveillance of bibliographic and non-bibliographic sources. We use the evidence that we find to develop and maintain living systematic reviews, either internally or in collaboration with colleagues internationally, and use those updated systematic reviews to then populate and maintain evidence profiles, which are then presented to our seven main expert uh, clinical guideline panels, together with additional expert advisory and other working groups. So those panels each week are meeting, reviewing recommendations and developing new recommendations, which are then submitted to our peak clinical governance group, which reviews those recommendations each week in consultation with a um, strong input from a consumer panel in partnership with the Australian uh, Consumers Health Forum. In addition, we have a independent conflicts of interest committee which manages all competing interests. Uh, and each week, those recommendations are submitted by the guideline leadership group to our steering committee, which is composed of a representative from each of our now 31 member organisations. We work very closely with both state and federal jurisdictions uh, through a jurisdictional liaison group. So we give advance warning to policymakers regarding the recommendations that we are soon to um, disseminate. And we hear from them about important policy and contextual issues. And so each week, we ask our member organisations to review and approve those recommendations, uh, and then they're published. So to give you some idea of how this has evolved, um, after we first started, within a week, we've pub we published our first set of recommendations. Uh, we also practice, uh, published a number of practice statements in the form of clinical flowcharts. And so you can see here over the first three months of operation, we had a gradually increasing set of content that we were uh, maintaining in living mode. So it, it actually forms like a, a curation type uh, activity. We've now developed uh, 88 recommendations uh, and seven clinical flowcharts. Importantly, we do at times make um, consensus-based recommendations. Um, we do this in a limited manner for very important questions for which the evidence is um, extremely limited or absent. Of course, in the living model, one of the opportunities is that we can very rapidly respond to new research evidence. So when major trials have been published, incorporated into our evidence um, uh, profiles, we can then um, each week present that to our panels and update our recommendations. There is often some concern, I think, uh, regarding living guidelines about whether that change in recommendations is unsettling or confusing to clinicians. But what we've found, certainly anecdotally, is that people highly value the fact that we are able to maintain our guidelines in this up-to-date state you're often aware of new research coming out and to see that rapidly incorporated into the national guidelines, we feel produces a great sense of, of, of um, trust. One of the opportunities in the, in the living models is that we can respond rapidly to the questions of clinicians. So we promote widely the opportunity for clinicians to submit their questions through our website. And it's those questions that we then present to our panels and it forms the basis for their work plans. So we respond very dynamically to the changing needs and questions of Australian clinicians. Uh, we disseminate it through, through um, uh, digital platforms, um, through our member networks, uh, and of course, through social and other, other media. Just to give you some idea about um, the initial evaluation that we've um, conducted, in general, we've found that clinicians, government, other stakeholders are extremely pleased with the, um, the work that the task force is undertaking. I just note here that actually it's the updating um, that is one of the most highly valuable, valued aspects of the guidelines that we are producing. So just to note some of the key challenges that we've found, 
first of all, methodologically, there's often been difficulty in deciding whether we should be developing our own internal living systematic review or um, borrowing from the work of others. Obviously, that process of understanding the quality, but also the timeliness of the work of those external groups. Procedurally, you might imagine that there's been a lot of challenges in scheduling and timing, but actually, I would have to say at this point, although it remains uh, a lot of work to maintain the guidelines, we actually have now quite a um, tightly managed and, and very feasible um, weekly schedule. We do ask our partners for very rapid approval, and we've found an incredible engagement from those partner organisations in this um, rapid approval process in order to maintain the currency of the guidelines. We, we use a number of um, technological platforms, but of course, as many of you will know, one of the challenges at the moment is that they are separate platforms. Uh, and then, as you would expect, of course, one of the challenges is around opposing views, both from our members uh, and then lack of consensus among jurisdictional governments. We do use a 100% consensus model. So of course, that at times can be quite challenging but it gives our member organisations a great sense of reassurance that no recommendation will be published without their approval. And that really is the glue that holds the task force together. So I just want to conclude in, of course, um, paying my respect and um, great thanks to all of the clinicians who are involved and now over 200 in all of our panels who are contributing in many, many different ways. Um, of course, to our partners and funders. Um, and again, I'm very sorry I'm not able to participate in the um, question and answer portion of this session, but certainly do get in contact if you have any question, we'd be very happy to share more information. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, that was really, I think, despite the absence of the actual speaker, I think it was extremely informative and um, I'm sure that there will be quite a few questions um, for Julian that we will pose by, by email. One of the first questions and possibly issue, uh, issues of clarification um, um, that, that, I would, that I would expect and that we've been asking for um, probably relates to uh, the confusion between consensus statements and guidelines. Um, I think that, that, uh, uh, that will require some debate eventually because um, any guideline requires consensus in our way, in our in in, in our eyes, and um, it's just uh, I think it's a it's potentially problematic to continue using that terminology of consensus statements versus guidelines because it seems to imply, and we know that this is misunderstood, it seems to imply that um, uh, that consensus is not required in a guideline process. Before we go out to our next speaker, I um, I wanted to. To uh, um, I wanted to play a little video clip, um, um, which I think is very much at the heart of what we're talking about. Um, give me just one second. I think in the, in, in the beginning, we've done things based on the knowledge we had at the time. And hopefully, and I am, and my colleagues are humble enough and modest enough to realize that as new data comes, you make different recommendations. Okay. That's it. Um, so the issue is around new data, new recommendations, but how are we going to deal with it? So I handed over um, to um, Eddie to introduce our next speaker, Eliakel. And um, Eddie, if you want me to, I pull up the introduction slide. That would be great, Holger, thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Eliakel, who I've known for many years, is a tenured professor of medicine at the American University of Beirut, where he's in charge of general internal medicine and geriatrics and their Clinical Research Institute, as well as the AUB Grade Center. Um, Dr. Ackle is very accomplished, uh, Ellie. He has close to 400 peer-reviewed publications and has been listed by Thomson Reuters in 2015 as a highly cited researcher. His interests are in rapid guidelines, living guidelines, equity, and guideline adaptation. And lately, 
uh, about conflicting recommendations and guidelines. And just on a quick personal note, it was about 10 years ago that uh, Ellie helped me complete my first uh, grade evidence profile table as part of a stroke project with the American College of Uh oh, I think we lost Eddie, which always can happen as uh, um, obviously- Chess physicians, and I am forever grateful for getting me started on that road. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you for the kind presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear yes. you fine, sorry. Okay, okay. Thank you, Adi, and it's a real pleasure to be here and to be presenting about uh, living guidelines. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I'm glad to be here to share uh, our experience with rapid and living guidelines. And it's been a good opportunity to reflect on some of the issues, and hopefully you'll find this uh, informative. And I'm happy I'm coming after Julian's presentation because it sets uh, the background for mine. Uh, so this is my disclosure, uh, director of the AUB Great Center, and uh, I'm going to be citing some of our methodological work. Really? Yes. Drop this place. We are showing your presenter view. We are seeing your presenter view. If you okay. just stop it. thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to go over, over a very brief history, uh, then talk about uh, COVID-19 and living guideline. As you might have seen, my title is, uh, is COVID-19 a turning point for living guidelines? Uh, I'm going to talk about challenges, achievements, and then end uh, by looking forward. So the brief history, I went back to check when was the first time a living guideline was cited. I bumped into this uh, paper uh, published in 2007. Actually, it was by um, artificial intelligence scientists. And this is how it started, uh, at least as far as I could find. And then there was a period of lull. And I think the major issue is that, as you know, the main component, uh, a critical component for living guidelines is living reviews and up to that point uh, there was you know there was no major advancement and then enters the living review with so Julian mentioned his initial concept paper and then there was a, a major paper uh, in the BMJ about updating reviews which I think contributed to this and then we contributed through uh, the first series of living uh, coffee and systematic reviews. Uh, and then we published a series on living systematic reviews, and the, the last paper was about living guideline recommendations. Uh, in that paper, we proposed definitions for living guidelines, for living recommendations, proposed three criteria for uh, uh, prioritizing uh, living recommendations, uh, workflows, uh, but probably the most important proposal was that the unit of update uh, should be the individual recommendation as opposed to the guideline. Uh, we also propose the elements necessary for living recommendation, uh, and these are proving to be uh, really important, uh, particularly when you think about peer review process, publication, uh, and budget. And then again, you know, we had the concept out there and it was a period of slow progress. Uh, as methodologists, we tried to convince guideline producing organizations, it wasn't easy, maybe for good reasons. Uh, Julian's example is one example of success with the living stroke guidelines in Australia. And then enters COVID-19. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, probably uh, offered two things. First, it offered the unexpected uh, induction uh, for uh, living guidelines, but then it provided a test field. So we'll talk about this. In terms of the unexpected in, uh, induction, we had this unprecedented uh, global public health crisis with ripple effects of, uh, across the different sectors. Uh, and the decision makers asked for reliable evidence yesterday, as you all know. So the evidence synthesis committee had to deal with a deluge of, of evidence. Uh, so the evidence guideline went from being a luxury to a necess necessity uh, almost overnight. And then COVID-19 was what I'm calling the ultimate field test. And it wasn't an easy field test. Why? Because not only we had to deal with lots of information, it was also suboptimal information, 
lots of misinformation and politicization of that information. So to be a bit more specific, uh, so if you look at the number of publications we did, we conducted this bibliometric analysis, there are more publications of, on COVID-19, so this was uh, back probably in August, uh, than has ever been published on Ebola, MERS, H1N1, uh, and SARS outbreaks combined. If you look at the uh, number of trials that have been registered over three months, we had almost 400 RCTs registered, which is an impressive number if you compare it to a usual rates of registration. Uh, at the same time, so it was lots of information, but was also suboptimal information to deal with. So think about initially the lack of RCTs and having to develop uh, recommendations, uh, even clinical recommendations without randomized trials. And then the observation studies, uh, at least based on our experience, has, have been of very low quality uh, in terms of conduct and particularly of reporting. And then uh, the first session, if you attended that session, uh, was a great session about the preprints and how there was this torrent of preprints and the challenge of pre uh, the preprints and how the evidence or the information changes from the preprint to the eventual publication. And then the issue of retracting papers, even major papers from highly prestigious journals. And then the misinformation in the public. And you have to think that this is also in, on the minds of the guideline developers. What are they dealing with outside? Uh, so this study got published, I think, two days ago. Uh, interesting study that looked at misinformation. Uh, interesting that I found uh, the US president to be the major source. But if you look on the smaller print, it says by far the most prevalent topic of misinformation was miracle cures. And miracle cures is exactly what many of the guideline developing organizations uh, had to deal with. And then the politicization of information about whether it's about the vaccines or the uh, convalescent plasma. And again, think about the effect of uh, how this is affecting the guideline developing process. Now the challenges, what are the challenges? I'm going to cover a few challenges uh, in terms of developing a rapid, or I'm sorry, living uh, recommendations. So the rapid effect, what's the rapid effect? Again, what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic is that there was a decision-making urgency. We needed to make decisions. So that's why we all went into the rapid mode in terms of doing rapid systematic review and rapid guidelines. So that was the first part. But it wasn't just about the urgency. It was also about the research, what we are calling the research to reach. Lots of information. So you develop your rapid guideline or rapid systematic review, but then you have almost double the, uh, the data coming in a month later. So this is why everyone turned into a living mode. So rapid mode turning into a living mode. So the updated uh, version of the recommendation in a living uh, guideline are being built on a rapid based recommendation that had to deal with study withdrawals, preprint, low quality studies. And we know from our experience <clears throat> and from others' experiences that this has been a very tough challenge. So any error in the base recommendation due to the either an error in the base uh, rapid review or the pro rapid process may carry over into the living recommendation and actually may carry over into more than one update. And then there is the yo-yo effect. So we described the rap rapid effect, but that same rapid effect, as well as the concept of the regression to the mean, where we know that the evidence, even if there are no errors, tends there's a, you know, there's a regression to the mean where the evidence might bounce back and forth that could lead to the yo-yo effect, where one day we recommend in favor, the next day against, and then we might find ourselves in a situation where, you know what, we might need to go the other way. So unstable evidence leading to unstable recommendations. Uh, so the yo-yo effect. So the yo-yo effect is when the same organization is uh, issuing a recommendation every month and finding themselves to go back and forth. But if you think also about different organizations working at the same time, under the same conditions, rapid conditions, lots of pressure, actually those organizations might bump into each other in terms of the recommendations. Because normally people work maybe potentially in sequence, they can 
examine what others have recommended, reflect on what they are recommending, and avoid these, the bumper car effect. So the yo-yo effect when one organization is bouncing back and forth and the bumper effect where different organizations are having conflicting recommendations raises the question about how are these impacting trustworthiness, particularly from the view of the public. And then comes in the living fatigue. The living fatigue is with people, I'm sure that people have experienced this, having, it has been called the sprint, where people had to uh, work on rapid guidelines, rapid reviews, living guidelines. And the question is, are we able to sustain the efforts? Then in a related, uh, related issue is retiring living recommendations, an issue they did not face before and they're starting to face but also a more general issue about the effect of sidelining the non-COVID-19 efforts. And Paul Crisp, uh, I think two days ago, uh, discussed how NICE had to sideline many of the, of the regular projects on the chronic diseases or whatever to focus on COVID-19. So what is the impact of sustaining living guidelines on COVID-19 on uh, other uh, you know, equally important projects? So to cover the achievements of this uh, COVID-19 era, uh, as it's still ongoing on living guidelines, I think something we uh, people have come to realize is the value of non-randomized evidence. So I did mention that many of those studies uh, were of low quality, however, people had to deal with those and had to find ways to integrate them into guideline processes in ways they have not done before. The other thing is the evaluation of contextual information. So we've talked you know, about the evidence decision table, the importance of acceptability, feasibility, resources, but this has become really important. Think about the example of uh, the PPEs and use of masks and initially how there were resource issues, the vaccine and the acceptability issues. And now this is more and more an integrated part of the evidence synthesis and the guideline development process. Also, there have been uh, evidence of better linkages between decision makers prioritizing the questions, the primary researchers, the trialists, and the evidence synthesizers, and the guideline developers in ways that we might not have seen before. So, uh, John Grove mentioned the example of the WHO Living Guideline. Uh, and one of the interesting uh, things they report in that guideline is how the, the, the data were made immediately available to the guideline panel, allowing the WHO guidance to be peer reviewed and published simultaneously. So we're talking about trialists, guideline developers, uh, the stakeholders working together. And I think this could bring us closer to uh, the, what we call the ultimate evidence cycle. So we're seeing lots of cycles for the evidence, uh, but one of the cycles that I like is this one where a, a participant, an individual goes into a trial as a trial participant. The trial is done, published, integrated in a living systematic review, integrated in a living guideline, and then circles back. And potentially that same person could benefit from the evidence that he or she had contributed within the trial. So looking forward, uh, I think uh, we have achieved timeliness in terms of our processes uh, for most of the living guideline efforts. Uh, the question is, how do we safeguard trustworthiness because of the challenges I have mentioned? And how do we ensure impact on patient and public health? Because we could you know, show timeliness, we could even show trustworthiness, but what is the ultimate effect on patient and public health, thinking about the yo-yo effect and some other effects. Uh, what we need to do is to build collaborations, and I know that these are taking place, but we need to strengthen them. And it's definitely time to innovate and not the time to act safe. So innovate in terms of new methods, tools, uh, in terms of guideline development, we've seen some of those uh, during this uh, pit stop, particularly yesterday. Uh, but maybe also new models of guideline development. It might turn out to be that COVID-19 will push us to move into different models of developing guidelines. Uh, most importantly, we need to keep in mind the ultimate goal, which is the benefit of the individuals and the societies.
So to answer the initial question, yes, I think COVID-19 is a turning point for living guideline, uh, but I think it might prove a turning point for the whole guideline development enterprise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. That was a fantastic presentation. I believe at this point, we are going to get the pulse of, oh, I'm sorry for any internet difficulties. Oh, we are gonna be putting up a poll to get your pulse on the topic of guideline, living guidelines. Holger, are you able to put up the uh, poll? Yeah, so here's the question for you all to consider. Do living recommendations offer more benefits than risks and should they be pursued? There are three options are almost always, generally not too risky, except for fast moving features, and it's really a case by case consideration. So we have well over 160 people in the audience and I welcome you to let us know what you're thinking. And I'll let this go until we've reached, uh, well, it looks like we have uh, near half or oh, even more than half of everybody voting. But I think the consensus, well, maybe not a uniform consensus, but the majority seems to be favoring the idea that it's really a case by case consideration. So uh, that's, that's a wonder, wonderful way to get an, a sense of how the audience is feeling about this topic. Um, if we can, I'd like to move uh, to some very specific questions. We have uh, Diane Kaufman asking, uh, about what platforms are you using and have been the most in effective for developing living guidelines? Uh, I think that could certainly be taken by Ellie initially, but perhaps other panelists might want to uh, weigh in. Ellie, are you okay with that question? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so we're using our usual platform, so, um, so we're using GradePro for the process of developing uh, guidelines, uh, both rapid guidelines and living guidelines. Uh, so I think, uh, I think about COVID-19 as a stress test, it's, uh, we've uh, it's been putting most of our methods and tools uh, into stress. Um, and I feel that GradePro has done well, uh, and it's an opportunity to improve those platforms and, uh, and methods. Thank you. Yes, so there's a question from Monica. I think they also, um, I know the Australians are using magic, yes. Sure, would anyone else on the panel wish to weigh in on other platforms that uh, have been efficient for living guidelines? If not, perhaps, Ellie, I can ask you a, a more- Question in the chat, Eddie? Yes. Is that, so the, the question in this chat box from uh, Ayrton in Brazil? Yes, I think so. Well, is, so uh, Dr. Stein is asking that one problem for the COVID-19 experience leads, especially in low and middle income countries is leading to higher investment on costly equipment for hospital application and decreased investment in primary healthcare. Is there any suggestion on pursuing healthcare managers to invest more in primary healthcare? Uh, good question. I think it requires a rapid uh, guidelines to answer this. Um, it's not specifically my field, um, but uh, maybe others uh, can address this question. Yeah, uh, uh, Holger or anyone else on the on the panel wishing to address the interface between uh, resource consumption and, and supporting primary care uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic? I, I, have no, I have no information on that. I suggest that if others in the chat, uh, other participants um, have, have suggestions to how to answer Ayrton's question, that may be a one way of addressing it. I do not know the answer. Um, uh, obviously, there is a... There is a <laughs> Uh, appropriate care provision 
um, even in the pandemic is critical, but I don't know the answer to that question. Matthew here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the question is actually, maybe is like my interpretation, which is maybe wrong, is, is the question actually about the focus of, of guidelines and if those are being led maybe out of high income countries um, focused more on some, I mean, not niche technologies, but um, more, more, you know, advanced, sophisticated management strategies. Um, and if those are being exported globally, is that, you know, missing the mark for um, some low and middle income countries where the structural issues maybe need a different focus in guideline topics? Maybe that's what the question is trying to get at. Uh, so, I, I can address that uh, if it's okay. Uh, Eddie, I, I, I should like to ask you something about the fatigue phenomenon you have mentioned, and mainly about the sustained effort that all these projects demand. Uh, do you mean uh, resources? Can you afford the resources in order to promote and maintain this activity? Or do you mean the capacity building? and developing all the new models in order to, to keep in charge of doing all this kind of work for living recommendations? Yes, thank you. I think it's uh, all the above. Uh, so first, uh, you know, there's the, uh, the amount of resources needed, particularly human resources. Uh, so uh, just updating the living reviews takes a lot of time, lots of effort, large teams. Um, and then, you know, you have all the other work that you need to do. Uh, I'm sure people are experiencing this, um, but then there is, yes, you know, there's not much funding. Uh, you also have the emotional fatigue from you know, going back and working on the same project nonstop. You think you are done, you know, closure is good with those projects. You feel that, you know, I'm done, I've submitted, I've published. It sounds like you have no closure with those projects and you seem to have with every update more and more data to deal with. Uh, so, yeah. I, su I suggest we go to the next speaker. We may have lost um, Eddie Rodrigo. If you want to introduce um, um, Ole, that would be great. And um, Eli, if you can, there is there is a lot of things in the chat. Uh, if you can um, look at the chat for you, uh, for the, uh, with regards to the questions for you, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, Rodrigo, I will just pull up um, Ole's Ole um, bio and, and you can get started. Okay, thank you, Holger. It's my pleasure to introduce Oleg Bishman. Oleg Fischmann is the head of the immunization unit at the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. He is also the executive secretary um, uh, to the National Immunization Technical Advisory Club in Germany. He also works as a member of the uh, World Health Organization Regional Working Group and COVID-19 vaccination and report. You want to get started? We are doing music right now. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused with the music, <laughs> so it's not me. I don't know where, <laughs> where, it, goes, where it comes from. <laughs> okay. Everybody. Okay. okay, it should be good now. <laughs> okay, so I, I may start. So first of all, thank you very much for the kind of... Uh, uh, introduction and, and for the inv uh, invitation to present here on uh, what we are currently working on in this uh, current situation on COVID-19 uh, vaccination. So I think uh, my declaration of interest has been already uh, mentioned. So, so I'm from the Robert Koch Institute, which is in Germany, the National Public Health Institute. And here I'm in charge of the immunization unit and, and also the uh, secretariat, which is developing the um, uh, vaccination recommendation for, for Germany, which is also now the case for, for COVID-19. Um, okay. I think now the screen's not moving forward. 
Okay, so I think most of you or all of you are aware that there are a large number of vaccines uh, in the pipeline uh, targeted against uh, COVID-19. I think it took only a few days uh, from isolation of the, the virus in China until the first group started to work on a, uh, on a vaccine. And, but of course, the number of uh, products in the pipeline, it's, it's uh, very, very large. So it's uh, completely new for us in the vaccination field. We are moving very quickly, so usually this takes uh, five to seven or even longer years uh, from uh, preclinical uh, investigations to, to approval. And now uh, we are moving uh, very rapidly. Uh, there are groups involved, so institutional companies uh, who are experienced in uh, vaccine development, but some are not uh, very experienced also in conducting trials. And uh, there are also some uh, special regulatory issues uh, in terms of when it comes to, to approval of the, of the vaccines. And several of these phases of these uh, clinical trials are moving in, in parallel. So this is a very unprecedented uh, situation in the field of immunization for us. So just to explain, uh, since not all of you might be aware of, of what we are talking about when it comes to vaccine recommendations. So there's usually the uh, licensure of a vaccine with a question, is the vaccine safe and effective for the intended use? So the uh, regulatory authorities, they look at product specific safety, potency and efficacy or immunogenicity and uh, the, the quality of a, of a vaccine. Uh, then usually it comes to a recommendation that at national level, uh, where a uh, national immunization technical advisory group or the Ministry of Health consider how to make, best make use of the available vaccines in a given population. So in addition to vaccine safety and, and, and effectiveness, uh, we look at regional or age-specific incidences of the disease risk factors. We define target groups if the whole population should be targeted or specific risk groups or age groups. So we look at population level effects, which is quite uh, unique to, to vaccines because we can induce with large or uh, up uptake of a vaccine population level effects, uh, hurt uh, effects. Uh, we also look usually at uh, cost effectiveness and implementation issues uh, at uh, our, our National Immunization Technical Advisory Group. So uh, in, uh, in our national advisory group, which is called STIKO in Germany, uh, we have got uh, some experiences in, in uh, uh, applying methodologies uh, from evidence-based medicine. So since uh, roughly 10 years, we have an established standard operating procedures we can build on. So we use here uh, systematic reviews, usually on vaccine efficacy or uh, effectiveness and observation studies or safety. We apply the GRADE methodology. We use uh, evidence decision tables. And uh, we also developed uh, some years ago a methodology paper for vaccine impact modeling and how our NITEC can uh, integrate evidence from such modeling uh, exercises. So there are specific challenges now which we are facing, uh, which I think not only we as a NITEC in Germany, but also other national uh, vaccine advice groups or even uh, international groups on, on vaccines. Uh, so first, what has been already mentioned by the speaker before, there's an urgent need for a guideline. Uh, there's a high public demand and political interest in the vaccine. So some people say it might be a game changer and uh, at least contribute uh, significantly, hopefully, uh, to uh, bring the pandemic to the end or uh, have the normal life back to what we had before the pandemic. So there's a huge uh, interest in the vaccines. And of course, uh, there's an interest also to publish these guidelines before uh, the first vaccines become available. Uh, because there is the need to plan uh, mass vaccinations. So, for example, if we say we should first vaccinate healthcare workers, it's a completely different setup than vaccinating first people in, in nursing or elderly homes. So, this needs to be somehow uh, uh, considered who to vaccinate first. Then there's this uh, successive introduction and, and data uh, availability. You have seen this uh, huge number of products uh, in different stages of the development. So we will have not only one vaccine, we have got uh, several new vaccines, also completely new vaccine technologies, for example, RNA vaccines or vector-based vaccines, where we don't have any uh, previous experiences uh, in broad use. And uh, there will be successes in introduction, introduction and maybe also 
For example, most uh, vaccines uh, include in the clinical trials currently only adults uh, starting with age uh, 18 or maybe 16, uh, but uh, later in the year, uh, they might uh, extend this indication to, for example, children. So there will be a lot of either new vaccines or new indications uh, already uh, from, from the regulators. And uh, we expect this uh, changes or new vaccines uh, over the next uh, one, two, or even uh, more years. Um, these vaccines will be also licensed under uh, it's called conditional marketing uh, authorization. So what they have at the regulatory authorities, they also call it rolling reviews. So the, the manufacturers or developers, they will submit uh, the data from clinical trials, uh, not uh, until the end, uh, from the end of the trial, but uh, in between interim analysis. And then depending on this interim results, uh, the uh, authorities will provide marketing authorization under specific conditions. Uh, the trials uh, will continue and uh, generate additional results over the coming years, so hopefully. And, uh, but also important data are only generated in post-marketing surveillance studies, so when the vaccine is already on the market and in broad use. There are additional challenges, so uh, I highlighted here, so there's usually with new vaccines some initial data gaps, but I think uh, with these COVID vaccines, there are more data gaps than usual. Uh, for example, uh, the big questions if there's an effect on the virus transmission, so if the person is vaccinated, if he's only protected against disease or severe disease, or if he's also uh, not uh, transmitting uh, the virus when he's infected, we call it sterile immunity, which is important if we vaccinate, for example, uh, healthcare workers, so they also indirectly protect their patients. Uh, also, for example, duration of protection. This is often not really well established when we introduce a new vaccine, but here it's also uh, important to know and, and uh, with, with other vaccines uh, being, being brought to the market, uh, at least the uh, clinical trials are a little bit longer of, of uh, duration, so at least we have got some better indication than for the, for the current uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Of course, there are also questions around vaccine effectiveness in specific age groups or specific risk groups, especially if we want to target first vulnerable groups. Maybe uh, the vaccine effectiveness is not very well established in this group. And finally, uh, we need to do some kind of priority setting for, for the vaccination. Of course, what is sure, we don't know when the vaccine will be available at the moment and which vaccine is the first one, but we know initially we will not have a sufficient number of doses to vaccinate the total population at the same time. Uh, so there will be limited number of doses. And so there's the question who should get the vaccine first. So there are not only medical epidemiological aspects, which is usually the aspects we are considering when it comes to, to guidelines, but there are also considerable ethical uh, social or economic aspects. So, so we are contacted, of course, by already several groups uh, who say we should get the vaccine first because our uh, employees are so important and, and, and uh, the teachers should be vaccinated first or others. Uh, so there are a lot of interest groups who uh, already approach us. And it also comes a little bit to the question uh, if uh, we as a national technical advisor groups even have got the mandate uh, to, to decide on this priority setting because it's uh, usually beyond what, what we're doing because it's had so uh, many other uh, implications on, on ethical, yeah, social and economic aspects. So this is, uh, of course, when we look now at the evidence, we will not uh, look at all the 180 vaccines in the pipeline. We only look at those uh, which are closer to the uh, uh, approval uh, and we only look in, in Germany, of course, to those vaccines which might become in Germany or in the EU uh, available in the, in the near future. So I don't want to go here into the, the detail, but uh, just to highlight here, there are different vaccine types uh, of those vaccines which we have on the, on the short list, uh, usually two doses. So there are additional questions on uh, if one can replace the other with a second dose. And uh, there are different phases and, and these are the submission uh, timelines, uh, Q4, but uh, when it comes to uh, approval, can be end of Q4 or beginning of Q1, 2001, or end of Q1, 2001. So this is uh, where we are at the moment uh, planning for. 
So when it comes to key factors, which we usually consider uh, for a guidelines in vaccination, so we look at the disease epidemiology, disease burden, usually using national disease notification data, maybe some additional studies to, to show how much is there an underreporting. Uh, we look at risk factors for disease or severe outcomes. Here we uh, usually, or we plan to use systematic review uh, or uh, use an existing one or update an existing one. Then if it comes to vaccine efficacy, effectiveness, safety, we plan at our uh, group uh, living systematic review. And uh, when it comes to vaccine impact prediction, uh, we will apply a transmission model, which we're currently pre preparing. And we look at uh, the economic uh, impact uh, by uh, putting on the top of this transmission model, the health economic uh, uh, assessment. And this all evolves into a living uh, guideline. So this is a little bit the concept, how we conceptualize how to work. You, you see here this, this timeline from uh, the top to the bottom. So uh, we're already looking now at uh, the risk factors and probably need uh, some update, but we don't think here is really a living systematic review necessary. But when it comes to, to the COVID-19 vaccine uh, performance, we plan here a living systematic review. I will come back to this later and uh, this, uh, evidence on, on the risk factors will go into a value um, a framework. Uh, there is one from WHO uh, SAGE uh, being developed. We are uh, planning to adopt something for, for the German uh, setting because there might be some consideration which might be different due to different epidemiology. And um, of course uh, this uh, information both from the vaccine performance also risk factors will go into transmission model and this will all go into a living uh, guideline. Uh, what is uh, then clear to us, there will be updates uh, of the transmission model uh, based on also uh, results from the living systematic review. And uh, there might be some trigger points we're still discussing here, but definitely when there's a new vaccine, new indication, or when we have the feeling there's new evidence which might uh, change here something in, in our uh, transmission model. And then uh, this will then later uh, result in an update of a guideline. But here I simply want to highlight that not all the time when we have got an update in our transmission model, this will result in an updated guideline. It really depends on the results then and if we or uh, the model suggests a new strategy, but of course uh, also other uh, triggers are important. If there is a new vaccine indication, our physicians or the vaccinators will need to have some guidance what to do with a new vaccine or uh, how uh, they behave with a new indication or if there are some specific vaccine characteristics, for example, on safety uh, signals, uh, this might also change uh, some kind of an update uh, in our guideline. So this is the, what we plan for a systematic uh, review. Uh, so it will be in the secretariat of our National Immunization Technical Advisory Groups at the RKI. We will jointly do it within a network of uh, National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, which is established in the European Union and coordinated by the European CDC. So we, we use this network to collaborate here and uh, to avoid duplications of efforts to make the results from the systematic review available to these uh, other NITEX, but we also collaborate here or exchange with uh, WHO and, and in Geneva uh, who are working on a review, but more uh, globally. So uh, PICO questions will of course focus on the vaccines licensed in the EU uh, and we will apply established uh, risk of bias tools and, and apply GRADE. And uh, we plan to search the nine databases and, and preprint servers with all the caveats. Uh, we will plan at the moment to have uh, update the systematic review every two weeks uh, with immediate data extraction and, and uh, meta-analysis. And what we're still uh, considering or still discussing if we can use clinical study reports directly from the uh, manufacturers in order to at least reassure that there's no important data being missed in the, uh, in the, uh, in the published uh, data. So start date, uh, we envision uh, November uh, this year and, and at least run it for one and a half years. And uh, these are the activities in respect to modeling. Uh, so as I mentioned, we develop a dynamic transmission model to compare the various uh, vaccination strategies. For example, if there are more than one vaccine available, uh, which one to use for which uh, group, because there might be differences in this vaccine. Some might perform better in the elderly than others and, and so on. 
Uh, we will also conduct surveys currently on contact behaviors uh, during the pandemic because uh, this is uh, different uh, than during the, the non-pandemic uh, times. Uh, so this is important for the uh, transmission model. What we also perform, there's a COVID-19 snapshot monitoring on, the ex on, on acceptance or general of, of measures during the pandemic conducted by a university in, in Germany, which we collaborate with. And we are able to put here also questions in this uh, surveys on vaccine acceptance. So we will ask, or we already asked about the general public or healthcare workers on the acceptance, but also about acceptance of priority uh, groups and, and uh, in order to form our communication activities later, uh, how to best communicate that uh, prioritization was, uh, was necessary. And we also perform some modeling exercises on how to implement actually the, the vaccination, if it's private physician or vaccination centers, how many we need and, and access and time to travel and so on. So this is already my last uh, slide. So if it comes to implementation and communication, so uh, we try to, of course, uh, involve various stakeholders in order to have these um, decisions, especially on the prioritization, not only with our NITEC, but also to have it in a broader uh, consensus. So uh, our Minister of Health in Germany requested actually uh, that we collaborate on this uh, prioritization, uh, that we collaborate with the German Ethics Council and with Leopold Diener, that's in Germany, the German Academy of Science, uh, to, to develop here a value framework for prioritization of the vaccines. And what is standard actually for our vaccination guidelines in Germany, that we have got a six week opportunity uh, that other groups, federal states in Germany or professional societies can commend our uh, recommendation and we consider their, their comments and, and revise it. Uh, in times of uh, the pandemic, uh, we reduce this time period from six to two weeks, but we still want to maintain this uh, procedure. And finally, of course, uh, we think of, uh, well, how to inform uh, those who are then vaccinating this will be a challenge if they're every once a month. Updates of this. That's not me. So the final page here on this. Okay, we prepare an information campaign. <laughs> okay, can I can I continue? <laughs> no, I think we we managed that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's actually only a, a couple of sentences here. So of course we pair an information campaign. So we are the guideline developers, and there are others who actually implemented. So. Uh, we need to somehow communicate this uh, how, why and how and, and to be as transparent as possible uh, how we prioritize the groups that are vaccinated uh, first. Uh, this should be even uh, done before we endorse uh, the recommendation. So we already have now uh, started uh, with some uh, uh, statements of our NITEX uh, for the population that we will be forced to, to do this prioritization and, and there will be uh, criteria of how to do this. Uh, we are still considering of uh, well, what to do with the living systematic review if we put it live uh, online, uh, but we uh, still didn't decide on this, but this might be also a way of, of uh, make it transparent. And, and uh, then of course we need to see how to best communicate the updates of the guidelines. So we have already established uh, uh, ways of communicating, for example, we have an application for, for uh, smartphones and, and uh, which is also web-based, uh, uh, which is the Stiko app uh, where we've got more than 150 users, 150,000 users. We plan here for, for push messages or we can uh, easily uh, send messages out, uh, prepare videos, fact sheets, and, and what is also in planning are webinars uh, for those who are actually then vaccinating. So that's uh, roughly what, what we are planning here in, in Germany in respect to the vaccines. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olive, for this uh, very interesting and provocative presentation. Uh, there are a lot of difficult issues in, your, in, your, in the content of your presentation, mainly the political governance, economical and cultural ones. Uh, I should like to ask you, uh, 
how could leading recommendations could help to uh, prioritize vaccination target population? You have mentioned that the transmission model strategy could be a way to do that. But uh, is it easy to introduce these methodologies in a living recommendation that needs to be very, uh, uh, very rapid updating every week or something like this in order to plan a national strategy to implant vaccination um, projects? I think it has been nicely uh, said by, by the colleague uh, who presented before. I think uh, we don't have much of an al alternative. I mean, we have discussed previously uh, if we can do for other vaccines some kind of living systematic reviews, but it was still not feasible because of the capacities in our uh, secretariat. But here, I think uh, it's a matter of, of trust that we cannot simply stop using evidence-based methodologies and, and, and uh, uh, don't uh, look uh, as careful in the literature as we did for, for other vaccines and even with this new development of, of completely new vaccines we're even more forced uh, to apply this uh, this uh, stringent methodology so I think there is no alternative and to be very honest I think uh, colleagues from the Canada probably will also uh, elaborate on this but I think uh, this is also a little bit a new field for us, how to exactly implement it and with a, such a rapid speed of uh, maybe every two or uh, four weeks. Uh, and, uh, but I, again, I think we don't have any other choice. Okay, uh, Ole, uh, Dr. Monica Nothaka, she wants to know, is a living guideline for COVID-19 vaccination one that should be updated so frequently? You mean this two weeks? <laughs> I mean, this is what, what we have uh, proposed, or this our current planning. But uh, when we look in the pipeline of uh, what, uh, how many vaccines there are and, and, and uh, how rapidly the, the data is generated, I think uh, this is also something uh, we at least want to try and want to achieve. Uh, some colleagues even from the EU network suggested every week uh, uh, but uh, I think we will start off with two weeks and then we need to see uh, if it's really necessary so frequently. But uh, uh, again, here, I think it's a learning by, by doing process. Uh, are you aware of some alternatives like, for instance, um, uh, artificial intelligence in order to, to, to ease the modeling process? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's actually to use artificial intelligence. This is a field where we have been already exploring also with colleagues from uh, from Canada. So uh, it's nice that they're also here uh, participating. So we are exploring of ways uh, of doing this in the future, but actually uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic, it's too early. Uh, we have not uh, established any way of, of, of using this, uh, but I hope of course, uh, the next pandemic, we will be able to use this. Thanks, Ola. One more comment, the last one. Uh, well, Amir Kassam uh, is worried because uh, is that hopefully well that we can speak with reasonable single boys when it comes to vaccine effectiveness to avoid any lack of trust and add to the confusion that already exists when it comes to vaccines. Uh, do you think that perhaps we need to rely on just the new national institutions of the globe to perform this task rather than many? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the, 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 the last uh, sentence, but uh, definitely, I mean, if, if we as one public health institute, is it sufficient if we do this alone or? Yes, it, it, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, as I said, I mean, we uh, do this actually in collaboration with the EU NITEC network. Uh, so uh, it's being a working group established, uh, which will uh, well, um, jointly with us uh, conduct this systematic review. And, and we are here in exchange with also WHO, at least uh, uh, when it comes to the methodology and, and so on. But uh, yeah, I think somebody needs to do it. And, and, and the question is, of course, if we can bring it into the broader uh, groups, but I think we have got these experiences and, and, and uh, I feel confident enough that we can uh, do this also in this current uh, uh, situation. But I think what is really important to, to uh, uh, also to apply here the great methodology that 
we look at the evidence related to the vaccine effectiveness and, and safety, but of course this can result in different uh, guidelines uh, nationally. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes the epidemiology or uh, also values might differ from country to country or also the vaccines which are available and the time when a vaccine is available. Or uh, So these are all the issues that might uh, impact decision on the, on the national uh, guideline. But at least uh, I think I would be happy to have a consensus in the immunization community uh, that what we uh, have here for the systematic review on vaccine effectiveness and safety, there's an agreement and, and that we all have here. The, uh, yeah, that's. I think you're mute, Rodrigo. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. Uh, my own perspective from the low and middle income countries could be a little different. And we have a lot of concern about which the recommendations are going to be in the next future and how can these countries can obtain the benefits and the, the right balance between risk, benefits, safety, availability, feasibility of this. So I think this is a, uh, a point of discussion that is going to continue in the next weeks. And thank you very much for, for the information and for, the, for this very, very nice and provocative presentation. Okay, thank you, Holger, I return to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ole, and thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, presentation so far and, and really a great segue into our next presenters. Uh, Ole, you discussed your collaboration with uh, Canada, and it's my pleasure to bring on board uh, the three uh, presenters from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Before we do that, however, uh, I believe you are seeing another polling question that is uh, looking to uh, see your views on whether living reviews actually improve uh, the quality of the evidence synthesis. Is, is everybody seeing that uh, poll? People should be seeing it, yes. Okay, great. So please go ahead and vote. Uh, we've had a lot of great discussion on quality of the evidence synthesis and, and to some degree certainty of evidence. So uh, your options are yes, based on what I heard today, or two, I am not convinced that uh, living reviews improve evidence synthesis, and three, no, they are too difficult to do. So checking in to see how you're feeling about the ability of living reviews to synthesize available evidence. So please go ahead and vote. <laughs> as, you, um, as you will see, we have really good participation. I think we can proceed with introduction of the speakers and... and uh, For sure. So I... I maybe to end the poll now. We have 65%. What would you prefer? Okay, well, I will go ahead then and introduce my colleagues from the Public Health Agency of Canada who will be presenting in sequence. First up will be Lisa Paddle. She's Senior Manager of Pandemic Preparedness and Response at the Public Health Agency of Canada. She leads a large team of technical staff and is, is dealing with some of the most critical issues before us uh, and providing guidance on a, on a variety of topics. She's a public health nurse with over 30 years of experience and has been involved in guidance development and leading teams through a number of pandemics, including H1N1, Ebola, SARS, and now through the mother of all pandemics, <laughs> COVID-19. Uh, I'll, I'll bring in the other, introduce the other two speakers so that we can just transition between them. After that, we'll hear from Marina Salvadori, pediatric infectious disease physician, works in, has worked in London, Ontario, and is a professor of pediatrics at Western University. Very interested in immunizations and immunization advocacy and has been a member of what we in Canada call NACI. She won the YMCA Women of Excellence in 2017 for her advocacy work. And now in February of this, past, of this year, she's joined the Public Health Agency of Canada and is living, breathing, <laughs> meaning all things related to COVID as she has put in her, in her notes. And then lastly, we'll be hearing from Matthew Tunis. Matthew Tunis is the Executive Sec Secretary for our National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. Uh, he's 
which is part of the, which is external advisory to PHAC, Public Health Agency of Canada, and oversees the work plan and scientific activities of the group. He is a PhD in microbiology and immunology and is an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa in epidemiology and public health. I will turn things over to Lisa to begin the series of public health agency presentations. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you very much. We're actually flipping the order a little bit. I'm going to start and then I'm going to pass the floor to Matthew and then to Marina and back to me. So we're tag teaming this presentation today. Um, I'm just going to attempt here to share my screen to get the presentation up. Super. Okay. Coming, yeah. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, Lisa. Okay. Am I in the right view here? You, you, if you click the presenter mode, down on the right, that would be great. There, yeah. to the right, yeah, 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 a little bit more to the right. One, two, one more. Oh. Is that right? Super, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. So um, on behalf of Matthew, Marina and myself, we'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present at the GIN 2020. Um, as, part of, as part of the fourth and final session. I've been uh, jumping in and out throughout the, the previous three sessions and have been really impressed with the fantastic exchange of um, intelligence, the, the processes for guidance development, dissemination, uh, and revision throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I'll say that uh, Matthew, Marina, and I are uh, living and breathing all of the same realities that many others are. So it's good to be in, in this good company. So um, what I'd like, we'd like to touch on um, with this final session is really to, to focus in on the living guidance perspective. Um, despite the balance of, of uh, we have to sort of weigh this really delicate balance between speed and rigor as many of the presenters have, have touched on, um, but we in Canada are, are going to talk a little bit about the checks and balances that are built into the system to ensure that our guidelines are based on um, quality evidence and we really try our best to avoid the uh, the yo-yo and the bumper car effect that uh, Ellie's presentation touched on. Um, I could also relate very um, closely to the comments that I heard from Paul Chris about the NICE session a couple of uh, sessions ago, where he, t he posited that a really key question for guideline writers is, um, are the guidelines in, in as they're written, reliable and useful enough to instill trust by the community who needs them? And enough such that you can proceed with publication. And, and really the key question is when is enough enough? Because as we've, you know, we saw from the previous presenter as well, that um, you know, there's just such a deluge of new evidence and new literature coming to the fore. And, and we just have to decide what happens when a new study or a, a body of evidence emerges that generates key questions about what you've written in your recommendations. Um, and is it pivotal enough to, to trigger a change in your guidelines? So at the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, you know, we, we really need to weigh in on is, you know, it's, is this, is this a, a um, uh, is this knowledge enough to trigger a, sh a shift in our evidence because it's just absolutely essential and fundamental to the pandemic response to maintain trust and confidence by the public um, and to ensure that um, stakeholders and guidance users are, are, are very comfortable and confident in the guidance that we write. So Matthew, um, Marina and I are going to each take our turns and, and tell you a slightly different story about our living guidance um, experiences from our respective teams at FAC. Um, and we hope that you will find each of these different perspectives um, interesting. And then at the end of our presentation, we're going to circle back and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we all um, have faced at the agency with, with our, our, our guidance. And uh, a lot of the, our challenges are not um, are, are very similar to the ones that were presented by Ola, um, but we, we, talk, we will aim to talk a little bit about how we address them. So the next slide. So, okay. So we just thought that it would be um, helpful for those who aren't as familiar with the, the system, the federated system in Canada to just go through really quickly um, how health is delivered and how um, public health is managed both in peacetime as well as in emergency mode. So um, for those who aren't um, as familiar, we could just say that it's, it's a local responsibility 
for the delivery of healthcare, provincial, territorial. In Canada, we have 10 provinces and three territories. And while at the national or federal level, we provide leadership and guidelines, it's ultimately the responsibility of provinces and territories and local public health to actually implement, um, implement the guidelines. And so while each jurisdiction is unique in their delivery of healthcare, we do try to align ourselves as much as possible. Um, and it's even that much more critical in a health crisis such as a global pandemic. So um, for peacetime or pre-pandemic, we're very accustomed to guideline development and we've been doing this for years. Matthew's gonna touch a little bit on this in his presentation, but normally guidelines take several months to even years um, from start to finish. And obviously this isn't, isn't appropriate in a pandemic. Um, you know, we've got this very well oiled machine normally where we, um, you know, we set up a research strategy, we vet it through committees, we go through a full lit search and eat, there's multiple layers and versions of guidance and um, there's always ample time for thoughtful deliberation and, and really laser precision on, on every section and every word of the guidance um, document. But enter a pandemic where there's immense pressure to provide credible and steady advice that's evidence informed. Um, and so really it's like guideline development on steroids. So, I mean, we go from a guideline that normally would take years to one that literally um, is published start to finish in a matter of weeks. So all that said though, there's still immense pressure to get it right. And so um, what we've, what we've uh, our princi key principle has been that we have to be transparent about how we drew the conclusions based on the available literature. And even when there's a paucity of literature or we're basing it on expert opinion, um, it's important to be transparent on where we draw those assumptions from. So we can't understate enough the importance to maintain confidence and trust in guidance. And it's guidance is, is developed based on a variety of factors, which we'll, we'll table throughout the presentation, but also at the end. So next slide. Uh, not sure how to get there we go. So um, this slide demonstrates the the transition from day to day governments to what happens in a public health response. I won't go into all of the, the details because it's a very bureaucratic uh, looking slide with all of these um, bubbles and and uh, lines. But just to say that in, in day to day governments or peacetime we have in Canada, a very layered um, network of people who are involved in making public health decisions. And that um, we have, we have um, a number of committees and groups that are comprised of experts and people who really uh, dig down deep into the, into the evidence to develop guidelines. And it goes up through a very formalized process through uh, the Public Health Network Council and also um, guidance, guidance documents are reviewed by the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health. So each, each medical officer of health from across Canada, from the 10 provinces and three territories are all involved in reviewing guidance documents. So in the event of a pandemic, we have a document called the um, public FPT, Federal Provincial Territorial Public Health Response Plan for Biologic Events. And this document's available online. It does provide a generic structure um, for biologic events, including uh, a pandemic influenza, was, which, which is sort of where we were grounding a lot of our initial response on. Um, but for any biologic event, we follow more of an expedited um, guidance development and review process as demonstrated in the, um, the, the structure on the right hand side. So the, the top red box, the special advisory committee is created through a merger of well, on the left side, you see the Public Health Network Council and the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health and they meet uh, initially, they were meeting three times a week. Now we meet regularly two times a week to talk about issues, guidance, um, key decisions, policy and, and technical decisions that um, are needed to be made in Canada. And um, our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, also, also is a um, member and, and active participant in this committee and takes a lot of her advice from um, the deliberations that happen at this committee. And so underneath the Special Advisory Committee, we have three um, other focused streams of, of work. The Technical Advisory Committee 
is um, is a, a group that's sort of a, a, a merger of the people who used to sit on the Communicable Infectious Disease Steering Committee, which you see on the left side, and then we we add additional members. And this is the group that is um, is uh, is in place to review the guidance that's developed by the bubbles that are underneath, which are all subcommittees. I'll talk to those in a second. Um, but the, the technical advisory committee receives, reviews guidance, and then approves it, and it goes up to the special advisory committee for, for um, additional review, deliberation, and, uh, and discussion and adjustment as, as necessary. So under the tech, so there's a technical advisory committee, there's a whole group of people that look at communications, and then there's a logistics advisory committee, which look at things like um, stockpiling, resources, um, and, and other logistical matters related to uh, related to management of the pandemic in Canada. So under the technical advisory committee, you'll see three of those bubbles that are that are highlighted in red: vaccine guidance, clinical care, and public health measures. And so each of those groups has a distinct responsibility, um, and they have their own networks and stakeholder groups and um, technical bodies that advise guidance development. And Matthew, Matt, respectively, Matthew under vaccine guidance, Marine, Marine under clinical care and medical countermeasures, and myself um, under the public health measures bubble, will we'll now talk a little bit about what happens with the guidelines that are developed under each of these groups. So with that, I'm going to transition over to Matthew to kick us off with the vaccine guidance. So over to you, Matthew. And I am going to try to give up my screen share there we go. Over to you, Matthew. Great. I think I just, I think I just took the screen. So I'm just going to presenter mode here. Um, great. Does that look all right? Perfect. Um, yeah. Th so thanks very much. Um, I mean, it, it's great to follow Ola because he's already set the stage uh, for a lot of what I'm going to talk about. And, and honestly, you know, listening to his presentation, it makes my blood pressure go up a bit because it's just seeing everything you know you have to deal with reflected back at you. Um, so NAS NASI, our National Advisory Committee on Im Immunization, is our Canadian version of a National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, um, which STIKO in, in Germany is the correlate body. So NITAGs are now established in 134 countries around the world, and WHO recommends that every country has an expert advisory group. Um, sitting outside of government to give that expert advice, uh, expert technical advice on immunization programs to the government. Um, NASI has been our NITAG in Canada for over 50 years. It's one of the oldest in the world. So there's a very long history of guideline development. Um, you can imagine though, you know, 50 years ago, we certainly weren't in the, the living guideline um, space. So this is a very new development. And we in Canada routinely review um, recommendations from other NITAGs around the world. So you know, I guess getting back to this, you know, the questions of, of the yo-yo and the bumper car that were brought up earlier, very relevant to us, absolutely. I mean, we are always looking at what other um, respected uh, NITAGs in other countries are doing. And it's always a good clue about, you know, what, what might be something to consider and what, what might be to come. It can also create some tensions when, uh, you know, when other NITAGs go one way versus another. It's hard to sometimes communicate that to the public. Like Ola said, you know, there's a very complex decision framework for, for each country on making these decisions. And um, the, the vaccine efficacy is only one of those decision drivers. There are many others. So you know, often we see different countries coming to slightly different conclusions and there are good reasons for it. Um, communication can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, and then within Canada, we have 13 provinces and territories. So it, it's a, a federated healthcare system, um, which is another complex layer. And we do have technical advisory committees at many of the provincial territorial levels that would also um, typically interpret the immunization advice, the national advice through their own specific jurisdictional lens where epidemiology can be different um, and uh, you know, cost availability can also be different in, in different provinces and territories. So that's another dimension. Um, this slide just is giving you a, a broad picture of the type of evidence space that NASI formally considers in their decision making. And these are all um, the, the key vaccine decision drivers that are also captured through the grade evidence to decision framework. Um, just some of them are worded slightly differently, but it's all the same stuff. So you've got burden of disease, efficacy, effectiveness, immunogenicity, safety, ethics. 
And then on the programmatic side, the acceptability, feasibility, economics, and equity of the vaccine programs. So this is the evidence base that we're, we're grappling with NASI um, on COVID vaccines. And it, so it's, you know, it's gonna be a complex exercise to keep each of these elements up to, up to date as we move forward. It's not as simple as um, I think a singular systematic or clinical review, which we would traditionally do on the efficacy, effectiveness, um, immunogenicity and safety. And uh, as, as Ola described with their living review in Germany, um, there are these other dimensions that we also have to make sure we're capturing in real time to, to onboard into the process. So adaptations that um, we're making with NASI to try and address this real time sort of living iterative context. Um, one of them is around our relationship with the regulatory environment. So unlike public health measures, as Lisa was saying, the, the, the threshold for triggers of when you need to actually update um, or initiate an update or, or an entirely new guideline is, is a little less clear. Um, for vaccines, sometimes there's ambiguity. You know, you, you want to wait until there's a critical volume or threshold of evidence that's been accumulated. But there are th some things that are very obvious, tangible drivers, like a, a regulatory authorization or licensure. That's an obvious trigger. Um, you know, we have no option but to react and respond to that when our regulator licenses a vaccine in Canada or changes an indication on, on the product label. So those ones are very straightforward. So to, to try and adjust to, the, to uh, the living reality here that we need to, to be working under with COVID vaccine, we're making some address, uh, changes to our relationship with the regulator. So this is you know, on the slide, the traditional pathway um, for vaccines in Canada. So you go through the phases of clinical trial, then they submit to our regulator, Health Canada. Um, and then sometime through, you know, which is usually a 300 day review. So you've got lots of uh, time in there. And we would start our public health analysis with NASI halfway through that review period, maybe generally. I mean, it, it varies from product to product. And then our guidance would typically come out many months after the product has already been licensed in Canada um, because you know, we're, we're advising um, the provinces and territories on their procurement decisions and what programs they should implement. So that time frame is not really going to work for COVID vaccines. Um, everybody can appreciate the pressure and need to do things differently. So one adaptation we've made is parallel review along with our regulator. And this has been a, a, a big step forward for us in our, our planning is to actually have um, shared information exchange and, and real time collaborative reviews. So Health Canada will be reviewing from a licensure perspective. We'll be looking at the same information, the same data in parallel, um, you know, when it's going to be submitted to both to both tables. Uh, so this should really help improve that timeliness and, and make us um, more able to, to pivot as the regulatory environment is pivoting as well. Um, and I mean, it's interesting to note that even though the regulatory space is changing, I think many countries around the world, including Canada, have adjusted their regulatory process to allow these rolling submissions that are, are not normal practice. Um, usually you would wait until the manufacturer has their entire submission package ready, everything they might need, and then they, they drop it on our, our table. But in this case, in the interest of timeliness, pieces are going to be coming in bit by bit, working, building towards a regulatory decision. And I think actually AstraZeneca's vaccine was submitted yesterday to the um, European Medicines Agency, EMA. So uh, yeah, that's stress for, for Ola to, to start thinking about. Um, you know, so these things are going to be submitted in a rolling way. The, uh, the data are going to be coming in in a different way even through the regulatory process. So even regulators are working under a different living evidence model um, as compared to normal. So that's happening in Canada as well. Um, on the next slide here is just an overview of some of the, the key changes and, and touch points that we're planning for with um, the living context on COVID vaccines. So Committee bandwidth and responsiveness, I think is an important point to mention and acknowledge here. Um, you know, there was some discussion in the chat about the time frame for the work that Germany is doing. And they have, a, I think, a two, two week benchmark for their living review to be updated. But that is, you know, is, the review is very different from the guideline. And um, it's easy to update a review. I shouldn't say easy because we all know how much work it is. Um, but that can be done secretarily with a few uh, technical experts. Updating an entire guideline, of course, as we all know, is a much more complex process. You have to convene your table of experts. Um, you have to go through some other consultations typically along the way. So doing that on, on a, like a weekly or a two-week basis 
seems very impractical and uh, infeasible in my opinion. Um, so to this point, I mean, something that is important that we've identified is, is leaving space on the work plan for our NITAG, right? These committees um, are, have not been sitting around waiting for years to, to build COVID guidelines. We have a, a very busy and active work plan already with uh, influenza, seasonal influenza vaccine or MMR, you know, every, every other vaccine is coming through the same committee. So we're clearing space on the work plan to, to make sure that uh, we're not overcommitting the committee so they have the bandwidth to react and respond when needed. Um, flexibility of, as well is important. So we'd established a high consequence infectious disease working group under NACI um, a year ago to issue guidance on Ebola vaccine and th knowing that the, you know, there would be a need going forward for some really reactive responsive capacity within the committee, we struck this working group. So very happy we did that. And that's the same working group that's working on the COVID vaccine planning. So they have within their terms of reference, they know that they have to be on tap. They have to be very responsive, reactive. So there's some you know, structural governance changes that sort of have to happen. I think sometimes around taking these legacy um, committees and transforming them into this new space. So that's a, you know, another challenge to consider. Um, capturing responding to the emerging clinical evidence. So for trial evidence, uh, as I mentioned, we're working closely with the regulators. So as soon as the manufacturers are submitting new data to our regulator, we're going to be looking at that in parallel as well and feeding that to our expert committee. Um, the burden of disease, we're looking at iterative systematic reviews. So Germany has done a, a really nice systematic review and meta-analysis on um, the risk factors for severe COVID disease. We've done one as well through Canada. And um, you know, there are many of these coming out now on niche populations, like you know, in pregnancy or in immunocompromised. Uh, we might look at actually an overview of reviews approach for our next iteration of that work, as opposed to tr just um, you know, constantly updating our own systematic review. Um, Post-market safety, of course, this, every country is working very hard right now to make sure their safety systems are, are structured to capture all the necessary data on COVID vaccines. So we're gonna have real-time you know, monitoring and reporting up through Canada. And we're also gonna be looking at the evidence that's being reported globally and, and published globally on safety, of course. And then post-market effectiveness. So leveraging some Canadian research networks for iterative guidance on uh, both the safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. Um, these are all things that are being set up now and that we're hopefully gonna reap the benefits of in six, to six months, 12 months, you know, when the, the vaccines are coming through. Um, capturing and responding to emerging programmatic evidence as well. So acceptability, Ola spoke nicely to the, the COSMO survey. Um, we're also using that COSMO tool in Canada and trying to do public opinion research in real time and uh, in multiple waves. So we do have plans in place to, to try and validate you know, NASI's assumptions about uh, the priority populations for vaccine and the vaccine candidates. As the guidance comes out, we should have, a, we have got a feedback mechanism to see how the public's responding and reacting. Then feasibility and equity, we also have um, you know, some real-time plans for that. So just to note quickly here about um, our splitting up the approach of the guidance that, that we've been taking. So the committee is working on preliminary guidance before any vaccine candidates have really been identified in Canada. So this is vaccine agnostic, you could say, but talking about based on immunization strategies and the at-risk groups, what would be the, the, the suite of strategies that we might wish to consider, knowing we can't actually nail that down until the candidates come through and we know whether they work in seniors, for example. Um, and then the final guidance will come in uh, fall or winter, depending on how these trials progress and how the, the submissions go. Um, and we'll have to be updating those over time. So we've been having internal discussions as well about not only the, uh, the intervals of updates, but also how do you even structure this, right? If we have now, let's say, you know, four to six vaccines come through and they each end up with like three, you know, one to three label extensions. Maybe they first come for healthy adults 18 to 55 and then they seek an extension two or four months later to go up into, you know, 56 plus. Um, as these things happen and, and the updates occur, we obviously have to re react and respond. But that could be, you know, 10, 10 guidelines over the span of 12 months. Um, which might be confusing, complex, and impractical. So we're, we're debating that right now. You know, is it to tackle each vaccine and each topic um, in parallel with separate guidelines, or do they all get merged together into one um, common living guideline that's updated incrementally? Um, you know, there are pros and cons to both approaches. So those are the type of things that we're, we're trying to sort through now before uh, the candidates actually arrive here. 
And then finally, a brief note, um, we also asked the committee to issue some guidance on research priorities for COVID vaccines uh, to, again, try and split up the, the different decision points to try and give some early advice now to, to the, uh, the clinical trialists and the manufacturers about what ideally we would see captured in those studies and those trials to inform the decision making from the guideline panels. So, um, so far we've been taking, I guess you could say a fragmented approach of trying to break out different topics and tackle them as much as possible in advance of the vaccines arriving. But we might see that once the vaccines get here, we might actually try and consolidate and uh, merge together different approaches into one common guideline going forward. So these are things that are um, being discussed in real time. Thank you. That's the end of my slides. Okay, I'm up next. Clinical farm. The clinic. Now I see you, Matthew. Um. No, that's not it. Matthew, if you want to keep them up, and I can just tell you when to change the slides, that would work. Uh, sure, I can do that. Because there's not that many for me. So I just want to apologize ahead of time. I'm, my neighbors have suddenly decided to do a massive, <laughs> uh, I don't know, there's trucks and all kinds of noise outside. So I've asked them to just stop for 20 minutes, and hopefully they will. Um, so... Um, part of the COVID response, uh, the, the part of the Public Health Agency Canada, where the three of us reside, CSIRID, the Center for Immunization and Respiratory um, Diseases, is designated to be responsible for uh, therapeutics. It's part of the medical countermeasures, which half of which is vaccines and half of which are therapeutics. And um, there had never been a um, really clinical care guideline ever issued from this group. And as well, uh, the public health agency is responsible for procuring an emergency stockpile, which is mostly things like personal protective equipment. We have ventilators and things like that. But we also have um, oseltamivir and, and, and such drugs for, uh, say, a flu pandemic. So you know, it, it was quite a nebulous thing that the clinical care kind of guidelines and uh, drug therapeutics was not a well set up structure um, with knowledgeable staff and sort of a machine that you could just immediately set into action, which was the case for vaccines and our really excellent, uh, nasty, well-known excellently uh, excellent staff and and really um, sort of well-worn pathways on how to work so as you all know with the covid the well-worn pathways have been challenging but this was a completely new one and uh, there was discussions about you know procurement decisions um, and how to balance the risk and benefits uh, how to assess shortages shortages because with the unanticipated closure of borders supply chains were suddenly very important and actually quite unknown to many of us and took require huge amounts of work. We had to have huge discussions with manufacturers. Um, and though that was really an interesting dichotomy, those that had authorized drugs, but were authorized for a different indication. So if in Canada, uh, any authorized drug can be used by any physician on individual judgment. So I'll just give an example that was fascinating was the hydroxychloroquine. It's an already established authorized drug. So technically, any physician can prescribe it. Um, and those patients, rheumatoid arthritis, who actually needed it suddenly had no supply. And people were using it without appropriate guidelines in another way. <clears throat> and then we had the drugs like remdesivir, which were completely novel molecules and had no authorization. And speaking to manufacturers to get some advanced purchase discussions. And so that, you know, should trials become... Um, and prove it to be effective, that we would at least have some supply in the country. We also had to balance that with our very well-established and excellent clinical trials um, professional groups, which are mostly done out of academic centers. So those are some of the competing and priorities that were quite uh, man uh, challenging to, um, to negotiate. Next slide, Matthew. Next, yeah, good. So 
Um, we realized that we did not actually have uh, that many experts. And I said at the beginning by training, I'm a pediatrician and infectious diseases specialist. So I really have no clue about the complexities of adult medications and in particular the elderly and the ICU space. So we need, realized immediately that we had to have an expert informed recommendation for clinical care guidelines. And so we, uh, we um, immediately uh, reached out to the Canadian Critical Care Society and our, uh, it's called AMI Canada, which is our uh, Canadian Infectious Diseases Society. And as a group, we just uh, did a first iteration of clinical care guidelines so that they were in the space. We were quite lucky that two of the people on that committee were actually the lead authors on the WHO first iteration of the clinical care guidelines. And if you look at the WHO one, um, most of the authors and all the reviewers, I know about 70% of them are Canadians and were from our team because it was from um, an academic group who are already involved. So after that, we decided that we needed to, um, uh, we also came up the, 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 the um, interest that we had to do procurements and as well, because of some of the regulatory landscape, uh, at some point, the, the only way to bring some drugs in was by um, this, this particular mechanism that the chief uh, public health officer can sign for unlicensed drugs. And we felt that that was, uh, she needed good support and we needed good rationale behind that. Next slide. So then what we did was we decided we needed a clinical pharmacology task group. Um, that was sort of like NASI, but uh, maybe uh, a lot smaller and more nimble because we felt that we'd have to move very quickly in this space. So we sent out um, calls for uh, CVs through the uh, AMI Canada, again, the uh, Canadian Infectious Disease Society, through the um, Professional Organization of Canadian Pharmacists, and through the National Organization of Clinical Pharmacologists. And we then um, made a very quick group uh, representing geographic and different areas of expertise. And we have uh, six to seven people and we made linkages with the CADETH, which is the Canadian um, uh, group who, uh, a government organization for drugs and, uh, and therapeutics and um, devices. And they do often uh, literature synthesis and they helped inform us. And we made this group and we retain all the decision making authority and policy making responsibilities, but very well informed by this group. So what we do now is that we summarize available information actually on a daily basis and keep going through the literature. Every two weeks, we have a two hour meeting all together and we have pre drafted uh, summaries of the literature sent them out ahead of time and this group has been very committed to reading and uh, thinking about it and discussing it. And we, um, and we then have made speech statements on each drug as they come through. So, so far we've done um, uh, the hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, remdesivir, dexamethasone, and now we're starting to look at the monoclonals. So we have to take into consideration, um, you know, the, the needs of the public health decision makers, as well as healthcare providers and we have done now a second iteration of our clinical care guidelines, which we still do in collaboration with uh, infectious diseases and critical care. We get wide buy-in and review from across the entire country for frontline clinicians. And, um, and so we have these sort of basically two pathways, uh, really medical frontline clinical care guidelines, which gets distributed through all the professional organizations and academic centers. And we have advice to public health decision makers on procurement and where these uh, therapeutics fit in. Um, it, it's interesting, I, I, I would just, in commenting on uh, how this works, um, one of the things that we've heard from clinicians is that a lot of the living guidelines that are about in the world um, are just bottom line guidelines such as you know don't use dexamethasone don't use hydroxychloroquine or do use mexamethasone in hospitalized patients at this level and they wanted a more comprehensive discussion with a little bit of the pros and cons so we decided though it was not the level of evidence base that we would usually do 
uh, like grade evidence base, et cetera, we basically made a system that was uh, green, yellow, or red about different interventions. And in fact, the drugs and therapeutics were quite easy to fit into those buckets where there seemed to be far more interest and um, was with things like prone positioning, uh, how to ventilate, should you use um, anticoagulation? So it was far more that clinical, more nebulous judgment space. I think where every clinician knows they have to make an individual judgment, but they wanted a little bit of the pros and cons weighed out. And that was actually quite difficult to do that. But I think that has actually been the most useful part of our guidelines, not just the bottom line, you know, good drug, bad drug. So um, next slide, Matthew. I think it's we, are, we, we have to stop. Okay. We do have to stop. Do you want to sum it up? Um, because we literally have only one minute left. Okay, okay. Lisa, you can sum it up. We, we still have a few announcements to make, so we ask people to, to attendees to please remain on, but if you want to do the final summary, that would be great. Okay. Um, Matthew, maybe we can go straight to the only thing I'll say about the public health measures guidance is that that's a little bit different is that um, unlike, you know, the medical countermeasure perspective, we had to get out of the gate right, right out of the right at the beginning, um, given that these measures are the only things that are available were available. And so um, the way we did that was we just gathered, we looked at what we did in H1N1, we looked at our Canadian pandemic influenza plan, which was sort of the guiding document where we did have all of that time pre-pandemic to put all of the, the um, more rigorous evidence-based evidence reviewed um, guidance together and then adapted it for the COVID, um, the COVID context. So we, we, we brought people together, we, we looked at what evidence gaps there were, how we can build on what was already published and what was what was in the literature, and then where we needed to develop um, unique specific guidance documents sort of it arose from that. Um, so this was all happening in early February. And so the publication of our, our public health measures guidance um, started right away and continues to be a, sort of a, an evergreen, ever, ever changing um, process using a, a lot of the similar same structures. So maybe what we'll just do is skip Matthew, if you don't mind keeping the, the keeping control here and just going to the last slide. Um, I think that some of the things that we wanted to touch on as a team were, and, and um, I, I know that some of this is repetitive, so I, I'll go quickly through it, but that um, we just feel that communicating uncertainty and evolving the evolving nature of the recommendations is our reality and it's very challenging to communicate what we know as well as what we don't know so when we change advice we have to be really precise about why the evidence is shifting and what has driven these changes so while early in the pandemic we didn't have a lot of evidence we had to be really clear about what we were grounding our advice on so we developed a specific document called our summary of assumptions and that all the other guidance documents that were created from that pointed to those assumptions and, and the assumptions included things like um, transmissibility, who's most at risk, period of communicability, and a lot of it was just based on what we knew about droplet spread and, and uh, respiratory viruses. So as we start to learn more, that, that evidence shifted, and then the guidance could not, the guidance didn't have to be, um, you know, something that we were constantly changing along the way, that, that, that uh, summary, of, as long as the summary of assumptions were, were still the same, then we were able to carry on. So um, the second point is a degree of uptake of public measures and long-term sustainability. So the fatigue factor has already been, been touched on, but the best guidelines really are dependent on the public um, uptake. And um, you know, communication and public health have to go hand in hand. We have to equip people with the tools that they need to help them feel like they have empower, um, they have control of the situation. We leverage community leaders and even non-public health groups to help transmit these um, actions and um, really rely on the community. And so um, we've been doing some public opinion research in Canada and uh, we found that um, overall we're doing, we, we, from, a, from the Canadian public's perspective, we are doing a pretty good job at, at doing this in Canada. Trust in science and government, um, 
you know, there's, there's hesitancy, there's mistrust by, by the public. It's becoming more and more prominent with our um, social media platforms, et cetera. So it's just um, really important to ensure that we're kind of keeping an eye on what's happening there and try to ensure that we've got our trusted leaders speaking often and, um, and frequent, frequently and consistently about, about our guidelines. Political climate and competing interests, I think, is um, you know can be positive or negative on the will of the people. And I think for, um, in Canada, we've generally rallied together despite uh, political views. But the, these obviously have to be um, you know kept in mind. And then, lastly, coordination and consistency across the country is important. So um, while we do have in Canada. Uh, as I said earlier, some variations across the country, we need to come at it from a united front and consistency as much as possible, but where there are variations that those variations are, are, um, are, we're transparent about why they are. So I think I'll stop there and, um, and okay. pass the floor back to you. Thank you very much. And sorry for the, the time crunch here at the end. Well, the good news is that uh, the vast majority of, of people are still on, and that probably means that there is big interest in what you had to um, what you had to say. And thank you, Phil, so much for for um, providing this lens, uh, providing this view through this lens. Um, Eddie, um, Eddie, there. Yes, a big thank you. And you know, we we are short on time, but I think it would be interesting to show the results of the last poll before we before we. Uh, and looks like pretty close call uh, and some uncertainty as to the impact of quality and evidence synthesis. Yes, and perhaps some, let's see if there are, if there are any from my point of view, um, people can obviously drop off, but there's still a lot of people on and, and there may be questions for Matthew um, 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 and Lisa and um, Marina, let's see. Sure. I mean, I think there's one that really resonates, uh, and it's from Ayrton again in Porto Alegre. What uh, does PHAC feel doing with regards to the problem of vaccine hesitancy, and and perhaps uh, mixed in with that is the the misinformation. I wonder if um, Lisa, you might want to address that. I'm going to actually punt this over to my colleagues, Matthew and Marina, who have been working a lot more closely on vaccine hesitancy and can probably uh, speak to this far more eloquently. Thank you. Sure, I mean, it, um, so vac there, there are a few things going on. Um, vaccine acceptability <clears throat> is part of the deliberations at, at our committee level. So that's certainly integrated into the decision making about the vaccine programs and um, you know, which ones they think will actually be have a meaningful impact based on which strategies will actually be acceptable. Um, it's not very useful to recommend a strategy that nobody's going to use. So it's integrated at that level. In terms of an agency um, push for to, to like ensure vaccine confidence, we are we do have a, a as you can imagine, a, a communication strategy around that. Um, I think the, the fundamental underpinning is transparency, right? Transparency about the, the regulatory process, transparency about the decision making at the, the committee level and about our safety surveillance and all of these different elements. So you'll see, um, I think a lot of information coming out probably you know, publicized in a way that, that it maybe isn't traditionally, not that things are, are hard to, to access, but there'll be probably more of a push towards transparency and our chief medical officer um, Dr. Teresa Tam is going to be a very vocal advocate uh, around the vaccine guidance, is what we understand. Great. Great. Good. Well, there's been some fantastic discussion and sharing of articles uh, in the chat window. Um, I wonder, Holger, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll throw things back to you if there's any uh, comments or maybe there's some still some additional questions that we want to. Yeah. But, uh, so what I what I do is I first of all thank you to everybody again. I will share my screen here for just a second. Um, we have a few other follow up slides. The other thing that I will do is uh, um, we still have quite a few people on, um, um, and and again this is I think an expression of of how interesting these presentations were. I will launch another poll as you're listening to me summing it all up. Um, um, the last poll is about 
a, a real big problem and that has to do with the fact that um, as we heard here initially we will probably have a lot of very low quality evidence evidence um, we've 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 heard i think from our colleagues from PHAC that um, in this context of a pandemic um, um, following the, the type of approaches that you would do for regular recommendations is difficult and that by default almost um, um, decreases our certainty in the evidence. Anyway, so we posed this question here um, that had to do with whether or not recommendations based on, on um, very low certainty evidence should actually be offered and we see the results coming in and this will be an interesting intercession comparison. While you are responding, um, I would like to again express my thanks to everybody who participated to, to, uh, today. Um, the speakers put a lot of work into this and I think this, a living, um, this will be a living document. Uh, I, I think in a few years we will look back and see what we have learned. Um, but at the same time, over the next few years, um, there will be people who are looking at these presentations in order to, I think, uh, improve their processes. And one of the really striking uh, messages here is that is the message around um, um, collaboration, coordination um, that needs to happen both on, on the smaller level as well as on the big international um, level. So um, in addition to that, uh, we are updating our um, our resources for COVID-19 on the GINnet website um, regularly. Um, another quick announcement of um, that new partnership on international guideline credentialing and certification that, um, the that McMaster is doing in collaboration with GIN and that we have just launched in terms of level one, level one. This website explains a lot of things. And then finally, if you have any questions, anything that you would address, like to address with um, GIN, the GIN Board of Trustees is available. You can reach us over Twitter and um, um, just other uh, means, obviously, um, including emails that you will have for us. Before I close, um, there is no closing without showing, the, the, showing you the final voting results. Um, and what you see here is actually um, your, our very final piece in, this, in these four um, pit stops. Um, and um, um, the question here was whether or not we should be offering recommendations based on very low certainty of the evidence. Um, okay. And uh, um, um, so the, the main answer here is probably, yes, um, we should be doing this. Users of guidelines want advice. There's very few people who say we shouldn't be doing this. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks to the moderators again. And um, it's been so wonderful to see you all uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great.